Okay? <clears throat> Should we get started? Um, so, uh, so in the lecture today, um, uh, I will make uh, a concrete connection um, uh, between scattering amp starting with scattering amplitudes, um, going through the the physically important uh, idea of on-shell diagrams and uh, connecting them to this uh, uh, wonderful mathematical structure um, uh, associated with the apposite of Grassmannian. Um, some of these things are, uh, some, uh, many of these things, some of these things were, were talked about uh, in Jake's talk uh, yesterday, but I will uh, talk about them, first of all, a little more slowly, and secondly, uh, from a, from, uh, from, from a, uh, somewhat complementary point of view. So, um, so, uh, so what the heck is this object? Well, the uh, Grassmannian is the space of k-dimensional planes in n dimensions. Well, scattering amplitudes, we know what they are. Bang gluons into each other, gluons come out. Uh, the Grassmannian is the space of k-dimensional planes in n dimensions. And if you're, if you're someone like, like me, um, you would be, you know, someone like me five years ago, you'd be bored stiff uh, the second someone started uh, describing this space. It seems like one of these random, abstruse things that only mathematicians could love. Um, and so what the heck could k planes in n dimensions have to do with scattering amplitudes? So that, that should be surprising that such a connection exists. But, uh, but in fact, uh, the connection does exist. We think it's actually important. And, um, there's both a set of physical and mathematical ideas that uh, uh, go along with this connection, and that's what I want to uh, tell you about. But actually, before doing anything else, before even getting into the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, somewhat fancier uh, aspects of the story, um, I want to describe why it is that Grassmannians should have anything to do with scattering amplitudes at all in an incredibly basic uh, setting. Why would you think that K-plane and N-dimension, those words should have anything whatsoever to do with the problem of scattering amplitude. So let's, let's first see that. So uh, we're talking about the amplitude for the uh, scattering amplitude for massless particles. So normally we specify, uh, this is well known to all the scattering amplitude people, but uh, anyway, normally we specify uh, for a vector like that, and we say that it's constrained to satisfy P0 squared minus P squared equals zero. Um, but a sort of constant theme in this business is to use, uh, is, is not to use redundant or constrained variables to describe what's going on. So here we're describing uh, something that really only has three uh, degrees of freedom by something that's four dimensional with a constraint. It's nicer to describe it in a way that's, uh, uh, that's uh, unconstrained. And by the way, going along with this is the fact that when we give the scattering amplitude, the amplitude is actually a function of, moment, uh, of, of the momentum of the particles and of the helicities. Um, that's really what, what the amplitude is. Uh, but in the normal way uh, we uh, uh, think about things, um, we actually compute scattering amplitudes, let's say, from Feynman diagrams. They don't have helicity indices. They have Lorentz indices. So they're Lorentz tensors. And then we contract them into these polarization vectors. That's the usual way of doing things. And this is, again, uh, as, 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 as we discussed yesterday, this is largely the source of the problem. Um, the actual amplitude, sorry, the, 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 the actual amplitude, even if it's uh, symmetry transformation properties, are that it's, uh, is that if I do a Lorentz transformation on the four momenta, I get a little group helicity transformation on the helicity indices. That's really what, the, what the, even the symmetry properties of the amplitude are. And that's not what we compute with Feynman diagrams, which are really Lorentz tensors. So we pretend that this object called the polarization vectors exists, that we dot into this. But as I said, the polarization vectors aren't unique. They really define up to some equivalence class like this. And so whenever you calculate amplitudes with Feynman diagrams in books, you've never actually seen one. You've never actually non-redundantly seen what an amplitude is. You always see a redundant representation where it's given in terms of momenta and polarization vectors. Okay? So if we're going to try to understand more into the heart of what 
uh, scattering amplitudes really are, it's a good idea to actually see what they are, non-redundantly. Just really see what they are directly. And um, both of these uh, issues here, the, the, uh, uh, the fact that we use too many variables to describe the massless particle uh, and impose a constraint, and the fact that we have to encode the information about the helicities in this redundant way, both of them are removed by the choice of a very nice new set of variables, which are the spinner helicity variables. And so the idea is that we dot the four momenta into the poly spin matrices and the identity to get this matrix, very familiar from many, many contexts. So using the two-component notation, this is something that has a dotted and an undotted index. The determinant of this matrix is just p squared. And if p squared equals 0, if we're dealing with massless particles, that means that this 2 by 2 matrix has a determinant 0. Because it has a determinant 0, we, we can say that it has, rank, it has rank 1. So we can write it as the outer product of one two-dimensional vector and another two-dimensional vector. So for example, if I have a particle moving in the z direction, sigma dot p is 2e000, and I can choose lambda and lambda tilde. Uh, lambda can be root 2e0, lambda tilde can be root 2e0. Okay. But now I've done something very nice. If you just hand me a random lambda and a lambda tilde, no constraints on it at all, I can put them together to build a null four-dimensional vector. <clears throat> um, some quick things about this are that the, uh, uh, if this momentum is real, this is a Hermitian matrix, so real momentum means that the lambda tilde is the complex conjugate of lambda star, so for this to be Hermitian, lambda tilde has got to be the complex conjugate of lambda. Um, but unapologetically, we're going to be complexifying everything in all of these uh, lectures. So when everything is complex, uh, for complex p, lambda and lambda tilde are just independent, complex variables. OK? Furthermore, in this notation, normally the real Lorentz group is SL2C, is just conjugating this matrix, uh, this, this matrix by L inverse matrix L, where L is a 2 by 2 matrix of unit determinant. The complex Lorentz group, so we're going through the symmetries here, the complex Lorentz group is actually an SL2C cross SL2C. And because everything is going to be complex, I'll just drop the Cs uh, from uh, now on. Um, and these act independently. One SL2C acts on the lambdas, and the other SL2Cs acts on the lambda tildes. The Lorentz invariants that we can build are things, the only invariant tensor we have is the epsilon symbol, so we can uh, contract two lambdas together. That's denoted by an angle bracket. We can contract two lambda tildes together. That's denoted by a square bracket. Things that we're used to, like uh, P1 plus P2 squared, which is 2P1 dot P2, in this language would be angle bracket 1, 2, square bracket 1, 2. Okay. <clears throat> and actually, uh, we can nicely understand why an angle and a square bracket uh, 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 occurred there together. Um, because there's another crucial property about these lambdas and lambda tildes that we haven't uh, talked about yet. So remember, the point was that there's only three degrees of freedom in this light like P, and we want to give it in a way that's non-redundant, right? That, that's not constrained. So here, we gave a lambda and a lambda tilde. They give you a null on shell momentum, but something seems to be wrong. There are still four degrees of freedom, two in lambda, two in lambda tilde. So what's going on? What's going on is that lambda and lambda tilde are not uniquely defined. Okay? If you hand me a P, uh, I can rescale lambda goes to t lambda, and lambda tilde goes to t inverse lambda tilde, and that sends p to p. Okay? 
Now that's really wonderful, actually. What does that remind you of? What does it remind you of, of some transformation that leaves a light-like vector invariant, but multiplies by a factor? If this was real, t would have to be a phase. So what is it that leaves a light-like vector, a light-like momentum invariant, multiplies by a phase? That's exactly the action of the little group. Okay? It's precisely the action of the, of the little group. So the lambdas are precisely the objects that, that we are looking for. They transform under the Lorentz group and the little group. Okay? And so the objects, these objects are Lorentz invariant, but we can then encode all the information about the helicities of the particle. We don't have to say what the helicities are explicitly. All the information about what the helicities are are encoded in some homogeneity uh, as, these, uh, as functions of the lambdas and the lambda tildes are rescaled according to this little group transformation law. Okay? And the homogeneity property is that if you have an amplitude that depends on lambda a, lambda tilde a, and the, and the helicities are HA, always A is going to run from 1 to N as the number of particles, then it has to satisfy that if you rescale each one of these guys, that it has to pick up a weight, which is TA to the negative 2H M of lambda, lambda tilde, and H. Okay, the 2 is there just because lambda is obviously in the spin a half representation. Okay, so already we can understand this uh, beautiful part Taylor formula that we, that this, this beautiful formula that we wrote down, that we saw yesterday, and which occurs at the beginning of every one of these talks on uh, scattering amplitudes. So when I told you the scattering amplitude for, let's say, let, let's write down that this uh, formula. Now we know what the variables mean, and this is a scattering amplitude for four gluons, well, for four particles, one, two, three, four. I don't even have to tell you that they're gluons and who the helicities are. We can figure that out by ourselves. When I rescale one, there's four ones upstairs, two ones downstairs, so it goes like T1 squared. And therefore, from that formula, that corresponds to helicity minus one. So particle one has helicity minus one, so does particle three, whereas two and four have helicity plus one. So amplitudes are functions of the lambdas and the lambda tildes that are built out of those brackets by, by Lorentz invariants. And they have to have a certain homogeneity under rescaling lambda and lambda tilde, reflecting the helicities of the particle and the action of the little group. So now these are the variables that the amplitudes depend on non-redundantly. Okay? Now we finally see what the amplitudes really are. Not just some representation in an equivalence class of what they are, but what they really directly are. And by now, there's a nice answer to the question of how you do this in any number of dimensions. Um, people like Donnell and uh, Rucker Bowles and other people have, uh, uh, have uh, beautifully solved this uh, problem. Um, but it's particularly simple in four dimensions, fortunately, so we don't have to talk about uh, spinners in higher dimensions that make my head hurt, so we can just deal with these simple things. Um, and uh, so this is the answer to the question, what are the amplitudes functions of in four dimensions? Okay, so, so we're after a function of lambdas and lambda tildes with these uh, homogeneity properties. And of course, it needs to satisfy some important physical properties as well. We'll come to those physical properties in a second, but I, I now want to immediately tell you, now that we're thinking in this way, why it is that Grassmannians should have anything at all to do with scattering amplitude. So our external data is a bunch of lambdas and lambda tildes. Our external data is a bunch of lambda 1 through lambda n, lambda tilde 1 through lambda tilde n, and they have to satisfy momentum conservation. Okay? So there's also something interesting here. Notice, normally momentum conservation is a, such a total triviality, right? Just a bunch of vectors add up to zero. But the fact that each vector is null is a little non-trivial. Non non it imposes a constraint. Now we've trivialized the fact that all the vectors are null. And now momentum conservation is an interesting statement. It's a quadratic condition on the lambdas and the lambda tildes. Okay? So we'll, we'll be coming to that in a second. But even more basically, I just want to think about this external data in a slightly different way. I mean, I can group it into a 2 by n matrix. So this is now doing nothing other than grouping. 
Okay? That's 2, and that's n. And this way of thinking about things, let me just call that 2 by mat n matrix lambda. And this way of thinking about things, we're led to think of the columns. The columns are the important things. But I instead want to think about the rows of this 2 by n matrix. So let me fix some Lorentz frame. In some Lorentz frame, each one of these are some number in the first entry, some number in the second entry. Okay? Well, let me just be super explicit. A1, B1, I don't know, up to AN, BN. Okay? So I want to look at the row, the thing made out of all these A's. Okay? There's an n-dimensional space where those A's give me some n-dimensional vector. And the B's give me some n-dimensional vector. Okay? So this is what it means to think about this matrix horizontally. Okay, now, in another Lorentz frame, of course, these vectors are going to change. So in some other Lorentz frame, I might have this vector here, and I might have that vector here. But here's the crucial point. The Lorentz transformations are just SL2, 2 by 2 linear transformations. That means that these new n-dimensional vectors are just linear combinations of the old n-dimensional vectors. There is something which is left invariant, which is the plane that's spanned by these two n-dimensional vectors. Okay? So the Lorentz invariant information, the Lorentz invariant information is in a two-plane lambda. Okay. A fixed Lorentz frame corresponds to just giving a basis for this plane. Okay. But the Lorentz invariant information is a two-plane. So already, even just thinking about something as basic as the external data, we start thinking about this idea of k planes in n dimensions, passing through an origin, I should say, all passing through some origin, so k planes passing through an origin in n dimensions, in this case for k equals 2. All right, there's also some plane lambda tilde. I'm just sort of drawing it schematically here. So this is a two plane. That's a two plane. Now, why did I draw it? This doesn't quite mean anything, as we'll see. Uh, this, this picture isn't really, uh, it, it, I can't really draw it on the board. I'm being a little schematic here. But why did I draw it to make it look like they're orthogonal to each other? That's because that's a statement of momentum conservation. Okay. Momentum conservation is an interesting statement. This is saying that any vector in the lambda 2 plane is orthogonal to any vector in the lambda tilde 2 plane. Okay. So already we have the external data is telling us to think about uh, Grassmannians in an interesting way. There's a, there's a 2 plane lambda, a 2 plane lambda tilde, and they're orthogonal to each other. Let me actually just pause for a moment. Uh, we might as well do, do, do it here because it's going to come up later. Let's just uh, pause for a moment while we're here to talk about the Grassmannian, which is labeled a GK comma N, which is the space of K planes in N dimensions, just so we get some basic things out of it, uh, out of the way. Yes? So this is lambda 1 dot lambda 1 tilde is equal to 0 is been uh, lambda, lambda plane, lambda plane. Yes. But this sum is zero. How does it No, 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 no. Uh, the, 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 the sum is, is saying that the, the, the sum is over the, this, this, this index. So that's exactly the dot product of an n-dimensional vector and another n-dimensional vector. So, yeah. so it's saying that these two n-dimensional, so this is in an n-dimensional space, not a two-dimensional space. These are living in an n-dimensional space. So it's saying that any vector in the lambda plane is orthogonal to any vector in the lambda tilde plane. So the two planes are orthogonal to each other. <clears throat> okay? Now, how would I specify a K plane in N dimensions? Just, just how would I do it? Well, I could give you K vectors whose span gives me uh, the K plane, right? Let me give you K vectors. Let me call them C1 through CK, whose span is, is the plane. I can always group these guys into a k by n matrix. Here's c1 up to ck. So these are k n-dimensional vectors. So I can group them into this k by n matrix. If I want to give them indices, it will be c alpha a. Alpha will run from 1 to k. Again, a always runs from 1 to n. Okay, but uh, 
I, I should be able to come up with any set of k vectors that are, I can do any k by k linear transformation I want. That will change what the k vectors are, but it'll leave the plane invariant. Okay? So, so if I'm going to describe it in this way, I have to identify as a redundancy C alpha A with any 2 by 2, any k by k linear transformation uh, on it. So, so this space of k planes and n dimensions is the same as the space of k by n matrices C modulo this GLK action. Okay. <clears throat> In practice, uh, what you can do if you want to um, uh, In practice, uh, we can use that GLK freedom to pick any K of the columns of this K by N matrix and set it to the identity. You know, and do a K by K linear transformation to, to set any K of these guys to be some orthonormal basis. For example, I don't have to do it for the first K, but let's say I, I can always do it like this. And then the rest of them are there and are generic. Okay. So this is a gauge fixing of the GLK. Any one of these things is a chart that covers part of the Grassmannian, but it doesn't cover all of it. For example, there are the k-planes that happen not to point in these directions. But the collection of all of these things cover all of the uh, Grassmannian. Okay. So there's a whole collection of charts that cover all of the uh, Grassmannian. What's the dimensionality? The dimensionality of the Grassmannian? Well, we can just figure it out. It's the k by n matrices minus the dimensionality of GLK. So this is k times n minus k. Okay. And uh, one more thing is um, um, what, what are the GLK invariant data associated with this uh, k-plane. The GLK, well first let's do the SLK invariant data. The SLK invariant data are the so-called minors of this k by n matrix. So a minor of the k by n matrix is you take any k of the columns and you take its determinant. So I can define a1 through a k to just be epsilon alpha 1 through alpha k, c alpha 1 a1 through c alpha k a k. So these are the SLK invariants. And the GLK invariants are just ratios of these things. So A1 through AK over B1 through BK are the GLK invariants. All right. Now you'll notice there's vastly more minors. How many minors are there? There are N choose K minors. The number of minors is vastly larger than the dimensionality of the Grassmannian, which is K times N minus K in general. Why is that? It's because there are relations between these minors. Okay? And the relations between the minors follow from a, just a trivial fact that if you take any k-dimensional vector, you can expand it as a linear combination of another k-dimensional vectors. I, I guess it's called Kramer's rule in uh, high school. Right? So, so um, that means if I give you a collection of k plus 1 vectors, there is a linear relationship between them which you can actually write very conveniently as if you have CK plus 1, um, then uh, uh, I can write it as 1, 2, up to K, minus, and you just cycle this over, CK, K plus 1, 1, 2, up to K minus 1, plus CK minus 1, it's an alternating sum, K, K plus 1, that's equal to 0. Okay. So there's a K plus 1 term identity that's satisfied, that's just the, reflects the fact that you can, ref, you can expand any uh, vector as a, as a linear combination of k other vectors. And so if I take this and I, and I contract this with k minus 1 other columns, I call this column ak plus 1, that's equal to 0. So there's a slew of quadratic relations between the minors uh, that are known as Pluca relations. And we're not going to deal with them uh, 
very much at all in, uh, in, in practice, but that's, that's the reason why um, there's, there's vastly more minors than the dimensionality. There's lots and lots of relations between these minors. By the way, in the particular case that k equals 2, these are the Schouten identities. Okay? But, uh, um, but uh, the, I mean, it's just this trivial Kramer's rule. All right, one final thing to say about the Grassmannian in general, which we also saw in our particular physical example, is that associated with any k plane in n dimensions, associated with any c, which is a k plane in n dimensions, is a natural plane that we might call C perp, which is just the orthogonal complement of C. Okay? This is an n minus k plane in n dimensions. So these two things are just very naturally paired with each other. K plane and an n minus k plane in n dimensions are, are naturally paired with each other, which is why the Grassmannian GKN is actually the same under this map, we can switch k and n minus k. Okay? And we also see that in the dimensionality, which is invariant under switching k and n minus k. OK, so those are all the things that, uh, um, in fact, those are the only things that you're going to need to know about the uh, Grassmannian. Um, but now let's uh, return to physics. So. That was just a motivation for why we're going to have to think about k planes and n dimensions. But now we're going to get our first beautiful payoff of this uh, geometric way of thinking about things. I'm going through incredibly elementary things right now, but from a, from a, from a language, it's the usual sort of thing. When, when there is a. Yes, in, in the particular case, so the lambda is an element of G2n. So k equals two. Yeah. Well, I'm doing general k. No, not 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 yet. Not yet. But I just decided to do this here because we were we were there. Okay. We will we will see what that k means and everything uh, and 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 everything later. Okay. But everything here is extremely elementary. But you know it is it's always the case when there is some new way of thinking about things. You can always trace it back to some new way of thinking about the most basic objects in the story that then generalize in a different way than you are used to. So we're going to spend some time thinking about incredibly simple things. Okay? And the first incredibly simple thing we're going to talk about is what, is what you might think of as three particle amplitudes. But actually, we're not even going to talk about the amplitudes yet. We're going to just talk about what the kinematics of three particles, massless particles with uh, satisfying momentum conservation looks like. Right? And already you see that when it's three, there's something very special. Because remember, we have to have a lambda 2 plane and a lambda tilde 2 plane, and they have to be orthogonal to each other. Now, suppose that the lambdas, suppose that the lambdas were a generic 2 plane. So that means two complete generic, three independent generic two-dimensional vectors. So here's a nice generic 2 plane lambda. Now this is really a three-dimensional space. So what does lambda what does the orthogonal complement of lambda look like? It's just a line. So that's what you might call lambda perp. Okay? But remember, lambda tilde has to be orthogonal to lambda tilde, uh, to, to, to lambda. So you have no choice. Lambda, the two-plane lambda tilde cannot be a generic two-plane. If it was a generic two-plane, it would be two-dimensional. The two-plane lambda tilde has got to have degenerated and collapsed to a one-dimensional plane. So lambda tilde has to actually be a one plane in this case. That means that lambda tilde 1 has got to be proportional to lambda tilde 2 has got to be proportional to lambda tilde 3. In fact, I mean, it's very easy to work out a representative for what lambda perp is. If the lambdas are like lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, a representative for lambda perp could be angle bracket 2, 3, angle bracket 3, 1, angle bracket 1, 2. Okay. This thing is orthogonal to that by the Kramer's rule that we just wrote down a moment ago. Okay. And what that tells us is that lambda tilde 1 
should be 2, 3 times some common zeta tilde. Lambda tilde 2 should be 3, 1 times some common zeta tilde. Lambda tilde 3 should be 1, 2 times some common zeta tilde. They all have to be proportional to each other with those constants of proportionality in order for them to be orthogonal. Okay. But this is, really, uh, this is really fascinating because it tells us that in the three particle kinematics, if the lambdas are generic, the lambda tildes cannot be. They all have to be proportional to each other. And that means that there's no invariance that I can build out of the lambda tildes at all. All the invariance between the lambda tildes vanish. Similarly, the other way around. If the lambda tildes are generic, then all the lambdas have got to be proportional to each other, and we don't have, uh, 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 and, and all of those invariants vanish. So for this reason, there is actually two configurations for momentum for the three particle amplitude that we can talk about, associated with a black vertex and a white vertex. The white vertex is going to be the one where all of the lambdas are proportional and lambda tildes are generic. And here it's going to be the other way around, where the lambda tildes are proportional and the lambdas are generic. Okay? And in this configuration, if we're going to write down an amplitude, it can't depend on the lambda tildes. And here, it can't depend on the lambdas. Now, this is an incredibly powerful constraint that allows us to completely determine what the three particle amplitudes are. I mean, just, just to contrast, for four particle amplitudes already, we're used to things being functions of s, t, and u. We just saw something like p1 dot p2 is like 1, 2, angle bracket 1, 2, square bracket 1, 2. I didn't say it before, but the reason why here we have equal numbers of angle and square brackets is that the p's are a little invariant under the little group. So for anything which is invariant in the little group, we have to have equal numbers of lambdas and lambda tildes. But we have no analog of this for, for uh, three particles. That's also obvious without any of this fancy stuff. You just have three particles, p1, p2, and p3. So what are the invariants? p1 plus p2 squared, that's p3 squared, that's zero. All the analogs of ST and U vanish for three particles. The only thing that you have is sort of pure helicity information. Okay? And then, so since it's just a function of the lambdas, so let's say for the black vertex, if the helicities there are H1, H2, and H3, this is 1, 2, and 3, well, I just get to write down angle bracket 1, 2 to some constant, 2, 3 to some constant, 3, 1 to some constant. That's the most general thing that it can be. And I can nail the constants by the helicities, which tell me the weights under transforming these things. This is the identical argument for what nails the uh, behavior of three-point functions in a conformal field theory. Exactly the, same, exactly the same argument. And so we can work it out. A is H1 plus H2 minus H3, and so on. Okay. Let me just give the answer so I don't... Uh, in the particular case where all, all the particles have spin S, and let me give it in the particular case where, uh, where, where two of them are minus and one of them are plus. In this case, this amplitude is 1, 2 cubed over 1, 3, 2, 3 to the power of s times the delta function for momentum conservation. And you can verify that that indeed corresponds to those uh, helicities. And just replacing angle and square brackets for the other one. Now, um, why didn't I write down the one? I can also write down one where it's all minus. That would actually be 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1 to the power of s. Okay. So you notice something interesting. These things have different units. Okay. This uh, vanishes more quickly at low energies than that one does. So if you're, if you're going to keep the things which dominate at long distances, it's these ones. Okay. And of course, these are the ones that correspond to the actual Yang-Mills vertex when you write down a Lagrangian. Okay. That's what you get from the Yang-Mills vertex. Except, notice that we've determined the structure of the three-point amplitude completely from symmetry. We never said a Lagrangian. We never said any words like that. It's purely determined by Poincaré symmetry and nothing else. 
And you learn there's one other kind of three-point vertex that you can have. In yang Mills theory, that would come from the F-cubed coupling. In gravity, it would come from the R-cubed coupling. Okay, but they're higher dimension operators. So if you're talking about the things that are dominating at long distances, two derivatives, it's these guys. Okay. So the unique properties. Oh, and finally, why don't we talk about three particle amplitudes in graduate courses? It's because we normally say they vanish. Right? We say there's no amplitude because you can't have a massless particle break up into two other massless particles unless they're exactly collinear with each other. And so that, that, that amplitude actually vanishes. And so indeed, it's true. The amplitude vanishes if the momenta are real, but not if they're complex. You see, uh, if we force lambda tilde to be the complex con conjugate of lambda, then lambda tilde being in this special configuration forces the lambdas to be in the special configuration. Okay? But if we allow them to be independent and complex, we get to see the true uh, invariant three-point function. And, I should have al and that also, uh, uh, you could say, how did I know? Why couldn't I have written for the same configuration? Why couldn't I have written a formula uh, for the other configuration uh, where I just, uh, put, I, I just turned this upside down? Um, I've imposed one more constraint that the amplitude should be smooth, shouldn't diverge in the limit as you go to real momentum. Okay? So in limit as you go to real momentum, uh, these guys vanish, the other guys would, would, would blow up. So it's a little distinction, but this configuration in principle actually doesn't care about the helicities of the particles or anything. It's just a configuration of lambdas. But this is the one that has to be associated with the one with those helicities and the other way around for these guys in order for the amplitude to be smooth in the, uh, in the limit of real momentum. OK, so the three particle amplitudes are completely determined by Poincaré invariance. Now, at this point, you could, um, let me make one more comment before proceeding about supersymmetry. So, so far, we haven't made anything, we haven't said anything about supersymmetry. But actually, um, there is a reason to be dissatisfied um, There's still something which is not as beautiful as it could be about, about uh, these on-shell amplitudes. Uh, the way we have them, they depend on these discrete indices, the helicities, plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, 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 minus, and so on. So if you have n particles, I have to give 2 to the n different helicity configurations. And they're very discrete things. Okay? It would be very nice if we could uh, talk about uh, these in a, in a smoother way. And that's what's uniquely wonderful about maximal supersymmetry. So thinking about scattering amplitudes begs you to make the theory supersymmetric, because it's so much easier to treat everything uh, uniformly. Um, and, and the idea is that supersymmetry allows you to unify different spins into a multiplet. But in particular, uniquely, maximal supersymmetry allows you to unify the negative helicity gluon and the positive helicity gluon into one big multiplet. And that's the thing that we're really interested in. We want to put pluses and minuses together in a multiplet. So we start with a plus, plus one, one of these, four of these, six of these, four of these, and one of these, gluons, well, gluons and, and all their uh, partners. And, uh, and when we have all these guys, when we can unify, when we can start with supercharges, act on this guy and go all the way down to this guy, um, it doesn't make any more sense to label the amplitudes by helicities. I mean, whenever you have symmetries, you diagonalize as many of them as you possibly can. That's why we work with the plane waves to begin with. For example, label, uh, think about uh, labeling things with external momenta. So we might as well try to diagonalize the supercharges too, but we can't because they don't commute. They don't anti-commute, but we can diagonalize one of them or the other one. So we can choose to diagonalize Q, or we can choose to diagonalize Q bar. And eigenstates of Q and Q bar are Grassmann coherent states. So in a notation, which is a little funny, but which keeps me sane and uh, stops me from making stupid mistakes, uh, we label these things with a Grassmann parameter, eta tilde. 
And this is nothing other than a linear combination of all these states. Okay? Plus, uh, plus eta tilde i plus a half i plus one over two factorial eta tilde i eta tilde j. These guys plus, I won't, eta tilde to the fourth, one over four factorial the minus guy. Now, I put the tildes there to remind me that q tilde, so eta tilde has an index i, which runs from one to four, that's the r charge index. And this satisfies that q tilde a dot i, acting on a state lambda lambda tilde eta tilde, is the only thing it could possibly be. It has to get an a dot index, which it picks up from the lambda tilde, and the r symmetry index that it picks up, let me put this upstairs, from the i. So these are the, so we've diagonalized uh, one of the supercharges. And now we're finally dealing with very smooth, nice functions of the lambdas, lambda tildes, and Grassmann parameters, eta tilde. Okay, so these are super amplitudes. OK? Now, as a superamplitude, this thing is, a, is some polynomial in the Grassmann parameters, eta tilde. Okay? So we can also write this as a sum over k of m, n, and k of lambda, lambda tilde, and eta tilde, where k is, where this decomposes this into pieces, where each one of these guys uh, has 4k eta tildes in it. So there are pieces that could have no eta tildes, four eta tildes, eight eta tildes. It comes in uh, multiples of four because of the SU4R symmetry. Okay? So we can decompose it into pieces that look like that. So now these are the two important integers that label amplitudes. Okay? And as a super amplitude, this is going to contain a component. I can project out components in the obvious way. Okay? This is going to contain components which... Uh, it's going to contain components where k of the gluons, for just purely gluonic amplitudes, where k gluons have negative helicity. OK. So now, right away, let's see something. Uh, we can see something uh, a little bit interesting. We know that amplitudes, all the amplitudes have to have some delta function for momentum conservation. But in a supersymmetric theory, they also have to have a delta function for the super momentum conservation. Okay? And so that means that every amplitude, with one exception we'll come to in a second involving the three particle amplitudes, but every amplitude also has to have a factor that looks like this. Sorry, lambda eta tilde. So every, every super amplitude has to have this times something. But notice that this already, without doing anything else, has k, has k equals 2. It has 8 eta tildes in it. Okay? So immediately we learn something interesting, that the amplitudes, when k equals 0 and 1, have to vanish by Susy. Okay? So that's a famous fact that in the older amplitudes literature is proven in a slightly complicated way using word identities and so on. It's just a trivial consequence of this uh, of this on-shell superspace. Now, of course, we have broken parity, explicit parity, uh, by the way we label the external states. We've chosen to diagonalize Q and not Q tilde. I could have done everything exactly the same way diagonalizing Q tilde, diagonalizing Q. Yes. Oh, th th so th this is this is uh, uh, this is um, uh, this is like delta. Of, this is like delta of, uh, of Q. Supersymmetry, yeah. So there's delta of p, and, and, then, and then there's the delta of q. Okay. But q and q bar don't commute, so I can't, I can't make both of them manifest at the same time. I can make one of them manifest. Now, had I chosen to label the states the other way, it's just a Fourier transformation, Grassmann Fourier transformation with respect to eta. Okay. Um, and of course, it just interchanges k and n minus k. Parity is just interchanging lambda and lambda tilde. 
and changes k and n minus k. So we also learned at the same time that the amplitudes for k equals n and k equals n minus 1 also vanish. So this is why when you even look at tree amplitudes for Yang-Mills theory, and of course the supersymmetry makes no difference for the tree amplitudes, all the extra particles can't, uh, can't wander around uh, at tree level, the amplitude of all positive gluons, all plus amplitude vanishes, and all plus and one minus negative helicity gluon vanishes. And the first interesting amplitudes can only have, the first interesting amplitudes uh, have to have two negative helicity gluons. Okay, so now let's write that famous Park-Taylor formula in a somewhat more supersymmetric form. Let's get a tiny amount of practice. So, what is a Park-Taylor formula in a supersymmetric form? Let me write it down. So it's just that, and then there's just the delta function of momentum conservation, and the delta function is the sum of lambda a, eta tilde a. Like a formula that was first written down by Nair. Okay? So this is the k equals 2 piece of the tree amplitude. So let's make some comments about it. First of all, if we just go back to the gluons, the gluons are bosons. So the gluons should have a nice Bose symmetry in interchanging them. Now, something I didn't mention explicitly, uh, and I won't, I won't explain in uh, detail, um, although it's been explained in, in a number of other talks, is here when we're talking about gluons, we're actually talking about color-stripped amplitudes. So there's, there's a color trace factor out in front of everything. And so the Bose symmetry of the underlying gluon should mean that the amplitude is cyclically symmetric, just cycling all the indices over by one. Except that can't be because they have different helicities. So the different helicities are breaking that symmetry, obviously. However, when we label the state supersymmetrically, that's not true anymore. When we label the state supersymmetrically, the underlying Bose symmetry is reflected as just as a perfect cyclic symmetry of the amplitude. And there it is. That's beautifully cyclically invariant under 1 to 2, 2 to 3 and uh, n goes back to 1. Now, how from this amplitude can I pick out the Park-Taylor factor? Well, if I want to put, if I want to put all but, if I just want to have i and j be negative helicity and all the rest positive, then remember the state was eta tilde was positive helicity plus dot 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 plus eta tilde to the fourth negative helicity. So that means I just put the eta tildes for everything to 0 other than for i and j. So let me first do that. So the numerator becomes just delta 8, eta tilde i, lambda i, plus eta tilde j, lambda j, over the rest. But now how do I pick out that i and j of negative helicity? I have to integrate this d4 eta tilde i, d4 eta tilde j, and some completely trivial and standard Grassmann algebra turns the numerator into ij to the fourth over everything else. Okay. So all of those funny fourth powers that people notice in the 80s in the structure of tree amplitudes were really secretly reflecting the underlying n equals 4 structure that was controlling all of it. Okay. And when written, when written in a manifestly supersymmetric way, everything is beautifully cyclic. Okay. So let's go back to the, so, but you see, from this point of view, supersymmetry is not something that's there to cancel divergences. It's just the amplitudes are begging you to be making them supersymmetric because it makes it so much easier to talk about them. Okay? And this is already true at this most basic kinematical level because it puts everything in one multiplet, but it, it, it comes up again and again in a number of other places in this, in, in this uh, entire story. It doesn't mean that it's crucial, uh, but it does mean that it, it is, of course, Lovely and very, very important. All right, so let's go back to the three particle amplitudes, which are the star of the show. Yes? You can. Yes. You can, but, but, uh, but, uh, but, but because it's a fake, you know, cheap shots almost never work. So it's a fake, and you're just, I mean, 
here, the important thing is, is that the, the, the dynamics of the theory is treating all these guys on an equal footing, which is why, why you're getting some uh, progress. Of course, I mean, I could just take plus and minus and introduce some variable there, and great. But that's just, that's really just bookkeeping. This looks like bookkeeping. It's a little more than, uh, than uh, uh, bookkeeping. But actually, having said that, I mean, the superspace for n equals 2 Suzy or n equals 1 Suzy, it's exactly the same, except you, you need to have two multiplets with a plus helicity and a minus helicity. So in a sense, less supersymmetry buys you precisely nothing <laughs> from that point of view, because you still need to have pluses and minuses. And you have Grassmann variables on top of it. Okay. Of course, it's still nice, but, uh, but anyway, that's how the uh, on-shell superspace would actually work. OK, so let's go back to the three-particle amplitude. Let me first write the k equals 2 amplitude now. Now, supersymmetrically, so this is just delta 4, sum of lambda, lambda, tilde, delta 8, sum of lambda, eta, tilde, over 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1. Okay. So this is, this is, if you like, m of k equals a 2 and n equals 3. But we also had one with two positive and one negative helicity gluon. That would be k equals 1, n equals 3. Okay. Now, but now you'll immediately complain that I just proved to you that all the amplitudes have to have this factor, delta 8, the sum of lambda uh, eta tilde in front of them from super momentum conservation. Okay? But uh, if you go back through the argument, it assumes that the external momenta are generic. <laughs> If the external momenta are not generic, which they are not in this, uh, uh, in this configuration, that's the one exception where it's not true. Okay? So you can indeed have a k equals 1 amplitude for the three-particle vertex. In fact, it's extremely easy to guess what it is. I mean, if we had used the other representation where we were doing eigenstates of uh, q instead of eigenstates of q tilde, it would be exactly the same formula with everything replaced lambdas with lambda tildes and this being an eta rather than an eta tilde. So that's what it would be in the other representation. So how do I figure out what it is in this representation? I just take it in that representation, and I Fourier transform it back. Okay? So that's how you can just derive it very straightforwardly. And what it is, 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 so let's write it down, sum of lambda, lambda tilde. And it turns out to just be a delta 4, because it's k equals 1. Delta 4 of uh, 2, 3, eta tilde 1, plus 3, 1, eta tilde 2 plus 1, 2, eta tilde 3, over 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1. Okay. And again, let's, let's check that it gives us the correct uh, helicity amplitude. It's the same argument. If I want to find uh, the one where, let's say, 1 and 2 are plus and 3 is minus, I put eta tilde 1 and eta tilde 2 to 0. Now it's totally trivial, just delta 4 of eta tilde 3. I do integral d4 eta tilde 3. That gives me the power of 1, 2 to the fourth upstairs. And that exactly gives me the right answer. OK, okay so, so we've seen that Poincare invariance completely fixes the structure of the three-particle amplitude. Supersymmetry is very natural and a beautiful thing to do to talk about amplitudes, because it makes it easier to group, uh, to talk about all the helicities at the same time. And, super, and, and it also in the, uh, makes the amplitudes manifestly cyclically invariant. And super Poincaré invariant, of course, nails completely the structure of the three-particle amplitudes as well. OK. Now, at this point, um, we could actually diverge. And, and there's a wonderful set of two or three lectures that you could use uh, to, to uh, explore the following line of thought, which is to say, OK, the amplitudes are nailed. At three points, let's go determine them at four points. So there's something a little funny. Uh, remember, here, everything is, uh, everything is, no matter what spins, I can have spin 13,000, um, I have consistent three-point interactions for any spins. Okay? So that, that goes against what we all know, which is that there's only a very few theories of massless uh, particles that make sense. So all the difficulties must occur already at four points. So, so, yeah, the difficulty has got to occur at four points. And I want to uh, just at least uh, sketch the argument um, 
things very much like this are in the literature, but this precisely is not in the literature. There's lots of little loopholes, uh, some little loopholes of the statements that are made of this sort in the literature. So I thought I might as well just uh, say what the, uh, uh, what the most general correct statement is. So the point is that now let's try to build a four-particle amplitude. So let's say just for fun, we're, we're not... We're not doing that when, when, when we do uh, Yang Mills, but that we're, again, only doing theories with a single particle, a single particle of spin s. Just one of them. I can write down the three-point function. So now let me try to write down a consistent four-point function. And let's say, I don't know, for fun I do it in this uh, configuration. Okay. All right, so... We know how to write down objects that have the correct transformation properties. For example, I can pull out of here a 1, 3, 2, 4 to the power of 2s, and then leave the rest as some function of the normal Mandelstam f of st and u. Okay? This factor out in front just pulls out all the helicity information, so whatever is left can only depend on st and u. Okay? Great. So that's all we conclude just from... Uh, just from correct uh, transformation properties for this guy. But now we have an important physical criterion. By the way, I should have said something back here. Of course, there's a coupling constant in front of these things that will be suppressing for almost all the rest of uh, these uh, lectures. But it is important to note that you know, these things can't be renormalized. There's nothing. They're just completely fixed. So there's nothing you can possibly change these guys with. There's just a constant that, 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 that goes with them. OK? OK. So but what is the physical, what's the physical uh, uh, restriction I should, I should put on this? Well, you know, for a real life actual scattering amplitude, if we peek at the answer, the scattering amplitude is a fairly complicated function of st and u. And it's not, just, uh, it's not, it's, it's not a, just a smooth function of st and u. It has singularities, it has, it has branch cuts, and, uh, and it, it, it's, it's complicated. But if there's any kind of weak interaction in the theory, if there's any sense in which these scattering processes are perturbative, then there is some lowest order in which this thing should only have poles. If we peek back at where it comes from, from Feynman diagrams, of course, that's obvious because the tree diagrams only give us poles. But, but we can say it a, a little more in, invariantly here. If we just look at the lowest order of approximation, so if we call that lowest approximation tree, even though we're not drawing Feynman diagrams, where we say that this can only have poles, then there's a very important restriction, which is physically where both unitarity and locality are imposed on this object. The restriction is that, first of all, the only poles, the only poles are where s, t, or u go to zero. Okay? This is locality. This is a statement that we should be able to interpret these poles as arising from in one, in one channel, making a particle that's nearly going on shell in the intermediate state, or the other one, or the other one. And furthermore, there's a fact that on that pole, the residue, f of s, t, and u, let's say as s goes to 0, should factorize into something that looks like a three-particle amplitude on one side, a three-particle amplitude on the other side, and a 1 over s. That's unitarity. So the kind of poles it has and the nature of the residue on the pole are the physical requirements and locality and unitarity. And we can impose them on this guy. Okay? Now, we know exactly what the three particle amplitudes are. So we can just translate this immediately to some statement about f. This is three minutes of algebra that I don't want to do. So let me just tell you what the restriction on f turns out to be. The restriction on f turns out to be that as s goes to 0, f of s, t, and u should go like 1 over t to the power of the spin times g squared. 
where those are, that's the three particle vertex. Okay, that's the coefficient in front of the three particle vertex. As t goes to zero, f of s, t, and u should scale like g squared over u to the power of s. And as u goes to zero, f of s, t, u should scale like g squared over s to the power of the scale. Okay? Yeah. Huh? No, I'm saying what I'm saying, first of all, of course, we have to impose that those are the poles. And then this constraint of correct factorization translates. I mean, all I'm doing here is skipping the two stages of algebra. I take this expression, I look at what its residues look like, and I compare it with the three particle amplitude. Okay? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, S, T, U. Okay? I mean the residues. Okay? Sorry about that. All right. So, whether we can have a consistent four particle amplitude reduces to a math problem. Can we find a function of three of complex variables, s, t, and u? Of course, s plus t plus u equals zero. Which satisfies these uh, properties. And so I'll leave that as a little exercise for you. It's extremely simple application of Cauchy's theorem and a little bit of thinking. I won't give it away, so you can have fun thinking about it if you're a graduate student. And the answer is, it's only possible If, if s is equal to 0 or s equals 2, in the case where s equals 0, f is equal to 1 over s plus 1 over t plus 1 over u. In the case where f equals 2, f is equal to 1 over s to u, or g squared. And so we've discovered that the only consistent theories is, and you know, even the three-point vertex in gravity, if you do it in some standard gauge, has got 80 terms. So this is a truly heroic computation, uh, and if you, if you use the Lagrangian, we just nailed it. Okay? And furthermore, we proved everything else is inconsistent. By the way, you might say, wait a minute, what about like phi to the seventh theory, or phi to the fourth theory, or something else? The, uh, there's a caveat here. Uh, what I'm doing is, is assuming that the fundamental interaction is the three-point interaction. And then I'm saying that there have to be other things at four, five, and higher points that must be there because of the presence of that three-point interaction. Okay? Those are the things that I'm constraining in this way. Of course, I cannot rule out the possibility that there are fundamentally higher-order interaction terms. But as we saw, they correspond to things that vanish at, uh, at low energies compared to these ones. So if we're going to talk about the leading things, then, uh, then this is what we're talking about. Okay? Where did you guys do this about the fundamental interaction? Huh? Where did you guys do this? Here. Here. Here, I assume I'm dealing with a, a, single, a, particle of, a, a single particle of spin s. And I, and I, I put in what I know about the three-point coupling here. Okay? So I write the four-point coupling. I say that on the residue of the pole, it has to equal this times that. Huh? Oh, now that is even true in in in, in phi four coupling, but 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 I'm starting. But the assumption is that I'm starting with the fundamental three point interactions and seeing all the other things that have to be there because of the existence of the three point interaction. So it's a phi four interaction that just isn't there to a, to a begin with. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. There's just no poles. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. So exactly. So 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 what I'm saying is that this is this is saying that there's a there's pieces of the amplitude that aren't that aren't polynomials uh, in the first approximation, but they're the, the most leading ones. Okay, the most leading ones that have to be there because of the presence of the three point ones. Um, but I mean, if you can't be consistent with those, then you're not going to have them consistent, right? So this says phi cubed is consistent. Then you can add higher point terms too if you want. But uh, but the only three-point fundamental interactions you're allowed to have for a particle of a single spin s are phi cube and gr. Okay. All right. Now, um, so oh, by the way, what happened to Yang Mills theory here? Um, well. I mean, we, we've just ruled out a, part, a single particle, um, uh, a particle, a single particle of spin one. We've we've ruled out, and it's really good that we ruled it out because 
In this case, the amplitude looks like 1, 2 cubed over 1, 3, 2, 3. Notice that this guy is anti-symmetric under interchanging 1 and 2, for example. Okay? So if this had been consistent, we would have violated spin statistics. Now, nowhere, notice, I mean, I'm, I'm going through all this very elementary stuff to emphasize that you can get all of the standard perturbative part of quantum field theory never touching a Lagrangian or talking about anything other than symmetries and consistency, which is, after all, what the Lagrangian formulation of quantum field theory is, is encoding, but we can also get it like this directly. We can get everything, spin statistics, we can get the whole story. In particular, it, it, it doesn't even let us violate spin, spin statistics. It just tells us that it's impossible. Okay? Very likely, yes. I mean, uh, 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 but you see, um, you don't really need to do it. You don't need to torture yourself because this is a four-particle test. So no matter what, how many dimensions there are, you can all, all always imagine the four particles are scattering <laughs> in, in a four-dimensional subspace. Okay? And if you're talking about tree amplitudes, it doesn't make any, any difference. Okay, but it would be perhaps fun to do it in, uh, in uh, higher dimensions as well. All right, so... Um, so uh, but, but there is, of course, something we can do with, uh, with spin one particles if we let there be many of them. So let's say there are many particles, and let's, for fun, call that interaction FABC. Okay. Then you go through exactly the same analysis. You put ABCD everywhere. You do the same factorization and everything. And you find that there is one more solution. When S equals 1, and FABC satisfies the Jacobi identity. So in this way, just in one shot, we start with the most general possible thing. Three particles, you can have anything you want. Already the four-particle test of whether you can have something that's consistent with locality and unitarity eliminates everything other than the theories that we know and love. Okay? So then here you're saying that now in principle, by locality and unitarity, you can in fact instantiate your spin statistics. Yes, it tells you everything. It's, I mean, and, 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 yes, yes. Now, I mean, of course, there are things here you know, I'm, 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 I'm limited in the way I'm thinking right now by assuming it's lower sort of approximation, tree level, and so on and so forth. But, uh, so, uh, but, but, but what, what's nice about the, the, this way of thinking is you're putting in no, no assumptions about the way the theory is being described. Okay? You're just getting it by directly applying the uh, physical principles that, 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 that we have. Okay, so one can actually proceed in this way. And, uh, and this is what I said. What, it's, it's a very, very uh, uh, interesting, I mean, it's a very nice exercise. I think I did it at Les Uches a couple of years ago, spending three lectures really developing all of the first, you know, one or two years of a, of a usual quantum field theory course from this, from this point of view. I mean, we can keep going show that you can't have multiple spin two particles, show, show the equivalence principle that the spin two particle has to have universal couplings to everybody. Uh, I mean, really get the whole structure. And not only, anyway, we can do all the sort of normal things that, that we uh, know and love from this point of view. You can even move forward to one loop. You can understand anomalies. Everything can be, all these things can, can be understood very naturally uh, from this point of view. But um, that's, this, is not the kind of, this is not really the philosophy I want to pursue um, in these lectures. Well, so just practically speaking, in other words, this is a philosophy that you kind of make a big onsatz, and then you hit it with the, you, 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 you hit it with the two uh, constraints of locality and unitarity. You try to determine what the onsatz is. Okay? The whole philosophy from the last lecture is that we want to find some other principles or some other picture or some other rules or something that locality and unitary are going to be output from. So it's not really in the spirit of what we're trying to do to, to like make huge onsatzes and then nail coefficients by imposing all these uh, equations over and over again. It's a perfectly fine thing to try and do. And it's also a perfectly fine thing to do to gather data. But what we're really looking for is some other, uh, is, uh, uh, is, uh, some other picture. And also, actually, practically speaking, if you try to do this just in this most brutal brute force way, already at five points, there's a huge number of invariants, and you don't, it's, not, it's not very, you can't just very stupidly uh, uh, make a complete general onsatz and nail, nail coefficients. Things like the BCFW recursion relations are an example of a much more 
targeted and sharp path through this uh, space of many, many variables in order to use this information to determine the amplitudes. Um, uh, but, um, um, but the most uh, brutal and straightforward way of doing it is not actually practical. All right. So that's, uh, so that's really the sort of the setup for the most basic things that we're going to need to have our discussion. And I just want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about these objects, which will then be uh, the, which will then, then, then really be our object of study. Um, OK. so. So given that these beautiful objects exist, these three, that, and they're all determined by symmetries and so on, um, I just want to spend a little while um, looking at some interesting things that you can do with them. Okay. So if someone hands me a three-particle amplitude and another three-particle amplitude, there are completely beautiful and variant things. And I can start trying to put them together in natural ways, just to get, make more complicated objects. Okay? For the moment, we're just doing this for fun. But in just a little bit, you'll see it's more than fun. These things are going to directly determine the actual scattering amplitude, not just at tree level, but to all loop orders. Okay? But let's, for the beginning, do it uh, for, uh, for fun, at least for n equals flow super young mills. But anyway. All right, so for example, I can take these guys. And I can draw a picture like this. Now, what do I mean by a picture like that? What I mean here is that uh, I can even do this without supersymmetry. Oh, this is plus, plus, minus, it's minus, minus, plus. What I mean by this is when there's an intermediate line there, uh, I'm, I'm just declaring that the lambda and the lambda tilde here, that the momentum here is the same as the momentum there. Well, we're drawing all the momenta as ingoing. That means the momentum here is opposite as the momentum there. Okay? And I want to sum over all the particles that can propagate in that direction. So I'd want to be summing over all the helicities. But again, because the momenta are in oppositely directed, if I'm summing over a helicity h here, it would be a helicity minus h there. So I'd be summing over the helicities. And also, since I've only nailed these external guys, I somehow want to integrate over this intermediate guy. But everything is on shell here, right? Everything is massless. Everything is on shell. So what's the analog of integrating over something on shell? Well, I just integrate over its phase space. I just want to integrate over the phase space of that intermediate guy, i. So the integral over the Lorentz invariant phase space of particle i. Now, here's another, another little thing that we do in uh, courses all the time. How do we talk about the Lorentz invariant phase space? Normally, to talk about the Lorentz invariant phase space, we fix a frame. Okay? And in that frame, we write d cubed p over magnitude p naught, something like that. Why did it get fixed? Sorry? Did it get fixed? Uh, uh, oh, in this case it's fixed. So, sorry. In this case it's fixed. Let me draw. Let me draw a more complicated diagram. In this case it's not fixed. Okay. Sorry. I was giving the rules for gluing things in the general. I'm going to come to that point that it's fixed in this case in just 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 a moment. But but that's what we're going to do. We're going to put these things together. Okay. We're just going to glue them together, and. We're summing over all the helicities on the intermediate lines, and we're going to integrate over the on-shell phase space for all the internal lines. Okay? And the integral of the on-shell phase space, this is a horrible non-Lorentz invariant way of writing it. What is the correct Lorentz invariant way of writing it? It's just the d squared lambda, d squared lambda tilde of the intermediate guy. Except this can't make sense. First, it's four-dimensional, not three-dimensional. Secondly, these things have a GL1 redundancy. So it's this thing mod GL1. Okay? And again, what does a mod GL1 mean concretely? Concretely, it again corresponds to picking a Lorentz frame and just saying that you can rescale, let's say, lambda so its top component is 1. Okay? But this is a much nicer 
Lorentz invariant way of saying what the integral over the phase space is. All right, so having given that rule, I can now start gluing things together in interesting, complicated ways. Right? And so this is an interesting suite of objects. Well, I'll tell you why you should really care about them in a second. But for obvious reasons, we call these things on-shell diagrams. They are not Feynman diagrams. Okay? Everything here is on-shell. Now, if you just think for a second, it, yeah. Yes, and it's just three-point vertices. Yeah. We're just gluing together the fundamental vertices, right? We're just, we just want to follow our nose and not introduce any ad hoc object that isn't there. So the three particle vertices are handed to us. And now these are interesting things that we can do with them. Okay? We can just glue them together. With supersymmetry, again, everything becomes nicer. There is no sum over helicities. The sum over helicities gets re replaced just by integrating over the eta tilde of this intermediate line as well. Okay? So the eta tilde here. GL1 yeah. will be separate GL1 for each. And there's a separate GL1 for each one of the intermediate lines. Exactly. Okay? It, it goes, it's a three dimensional integral, right? Okay, so let's draw these. Imagine that these are supersymmetric things uh, for a moment. Right? Now, let me just say something about them physically. Feynman diagrams correspond to local processes in spacetime. Okay? These things are definitely not local processes in spacetime because what we're doing is, if you think of it in position space, we're integrating over all the places on a light cone from one point to the other. Right? There's no time along the light cone. There's no locality along the light cone. We're integrating everywhere you can possibly have along the light cone. These are highly non-local objects in general. In general, okay? So we have no reason to expect that they correspond to local processes in spacetime. Right? Again, I, I'm sorry to be so pedantic, but these are the, the intermediate lines are not virtual. There's no virtual particles. We will never talk about virtual particles. We're going to talk about the scattering amplitude to all loop orders without ever talking about virtual particles. Okay. That's the central physical idea behind this, this whole approach, is to focus completely on these, uh, on these real on-shell processes. However, of course, we're allowing everything here to be complex. Right. So when there, I, I should have perhaps said this, I, I mean, it would, I could define these things very, very precisely, but uh, we're, we're physicists, so I don't, I don't really need to. Uh, when I write down those uh, delta functions, you know, those are delta functions that are really just imposing that the things inside vanish with some Jacobian. Okay? But they can be co complex. I'm not demanding that the solutions are real, and they're totally holomorphic objects. Uh, if you have a real delta function, there's a Jacobian, there's a magnitude sign that goes around it, there are all these horrible things, but everything here is naturally complex. Everything here is... Uh, naturally complex. OK. So these are the objects we're going to study for a little while. And now let me try to motivate a little bit why they're going to be interesting for us. By first making some guesses as to what they might mean. Okay. So let's start with the simplest one. So what's the most naive guess for what this uh, on-shell diagram is? Well, I don't know. The most naive guess is maybe it's a four-particle tree amplitude or something like that, right? It looks like a tree. Maybe it's a four-particle tree amplitude. It is not the four-particle tree amplitude because of Ashok's uh, important comment from <laughs> five minutes ago. You see, here, that intermediate line is forced to be on-shell, right? So in fact, this diagram vanishes for generic external momenta. It vanishes unless p1 plus p2 squared happens to be exactly 0. Okay? So this thing vanishes for generic external momenta. It has a meaning. What is that diagram? It's nothing other than the factorization channel. Right? It does exactly what you want. It puts a delta function forcing you to be on the pole, and it multiplies the two three-particle amplitudes around it. Okay? So that's exactly the factorization channel of an amplitude, but it is not the amplitude. Not the actual four-particle amplitude. 
Now, let me draw you what the four particle amplitude turns out to be as an on-shell diagram. Okay. And these are, by the way, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, as we'll see in a moment, these things are intimately, intimately related to the BCFW recursion relations. But I don't want to talk about how we got them or anything. We're, we're just getting used to what these things are. So this guy is the four particle tree amplitude. Oh, it's a little funny. It's something that looks like it has a loop in it, but this is actually the four particle tree amplitude. Okay. But let's get some intuition for why this is going to be the four particle tree amplitude. Well, actually, notice that the only difference between this picture and that picture is that I, it's like I took this and I put a little bridge on top of it. So let's talk in general about what happens if I have some on-shell diagram sitting here in general. And what I do to it is add a little bridge. I'll be, I'll be reversing my colors all over the place. It's not going to be uh, very important. Okay. So let's say I have some diagram sitting there already. And I'm going to modify it if this is a leg n, let's say, and that's a leg 1. I'm going to modify it by putting a little bridge there. Right? Yes? There's a G everywhere there, but the G's, you just count the number of vertices, that's how many G's there are. So I'm not going to keep writing a G over, over and over again. Isn't that right. a G before? Huh? Wouldn't the G level be a G square in the... Yeah, so, that, so there, there's, a, there's a minus 2 in front of everything. No, sorry, sorry. Um, so, yeah, there, 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 there's a minus 2 in front of everything. OK. So, so how does this work? Um, well, so let, let, let's think what, what, what this is doing. There's some momentum which is flowing there, right? There's some uh, momentum which is allowed to uh, flow there. It has to be on shell, so it's some lambda lambda tilde. Now, that black vertex, remember the black vertex forces all the lambda tildes to be proportional to each other. And that forces all the lambdas to be proportional to each other. So at this black vertex, that tells me that the lambda for this guy has got to be proportional to lambda n. And this tells me that the lambda tilde for this guy has got to be proportional to lambda tilde 1. So the momentum of this line has got to be some number, some z, times lambda n, lambda tilde 1. Okay? And you see there's actually precisely one variable that I've introduced here. Okay? Seems to be three, but they're, they're, they're the delta functions. And it's actually exactly one variable that I've introduced, which is that z. Okay. So what I have is an actual dz over z. It has to be dz over z, because z has little group weights under rescaling n and 1. So it couldn't be anything other than dz over z. But now what's going on in here? Well, here, the momentum of particle n is now shifted to be uh, plus qz. And here, the momentum of particle n of 1 is shifted to be minus qz. Okay. So I've done something very beautiful. I've shifted the momenta by adding and subtracting something in a way that keeps n and 1 on shell. You notice that pn plus qz squared is still 0. Of course, it's guaranteed by these, by these pictures. And this is also 0 because of that particular form for q. Notice also that Q is inevitably complex. No matter what you do, uh, Q isn't real. Okay? Q, is, Q is something uh, complex. So in doing these things, we're allowing all the momenta and everything to be complex. In fact, we can work out exactly uh, what is, because the, the, the lambda tilde here has got to be still the same as the lambda tilde there. Right? So it's the lambda here that's been shifted, and the lambda here, tilde here, which has been shifted. So what we've done is shift lambda n goes to lambda n plus z lambda 1, and lambda tilde 1 to lambda tilde 1 minus z lambda tilde n. Okay. So that, so that uh, oops, the other way around, sorry. So that you see that, for example, lambda n lambda tilde n has gotten shifted to lambda n, lambda tilde n, uh, minus z, uh, lambda n, lambda tilde 1. 
should put a minus sign there, a plus sign. Okay. Okay. So, so, um, so if I summarize this, if I take something and I add a bridge to it, it's called the BCFW bridge because this deformation is exactly the uh, BCFW deformation. I get dz over z. So if this thing was f, this is going to be dz over z, f of 1 hat, n hat, and 1 hat, and everything else is the same, where those are the rules. So lambda uh, 1 hat is lambda 1 plus z lambda n. Lambda tilde n hat is lambda tilde n minus z lambda tilde 1. And if you do it super symmetrically, the eta tildes do exactly what the, the eta tildes also shift. Okay. Beautiful. This adding a bridge is going to be a very, very important operation uh, in, our, in our story, so I wanted to uh, go, go through it carefully here. But now this, this really lets us interpret this, uh, this uh, picture. Well, let me go back. So let's start with this, uh, so let's start with this factorization channel. And now we're adding a bridge. So why is it reasonable that this might be the tree amplitude now? It's reasonable because, you see, in here, these guys have to be very, very special in order for that plus that squared to be 0. It has to be really sitting on the factorization channel. But adding this bridge is allowing the external guys to be generic. And in fact, it's exactly hunting around in z space and looking for the place where it's possible to put this intermediate guy on shell. OK? So that's why this is something which can be uh, this is something which can be non-zero for generic external data. One, two, three, four. Okay? Is that clear? But now I hope you're impressed with something. Because I'm telling you, if you actually evaluate it, this is the whole tree amplitude. But it's one term. There's one term which is giving you the whole tree amplitude. Normally, when we compute the tree amplitude, even if it's planar, it's a sum of... Three terms like that, right? Well, we actually calculate the Feynman diagram, sum of three terms. And it's, we say, there's the S channel, there's the T channel, and then there's this contact thing that fixes up the gauge non-invariance of these crappy terms, right? So that's normally how it is in field theory. You have to see the different channels in, in different ways. But I'm telling you that this one object is the whole answer, and we can see all of, the, all of its uh, different factorization channels in one go. So how is that possible? Well, you see, in the way we just thought about it, by thinking about it as the bridge there, we were exposing the S-channel factorization. Right? We said, aha, I'm hunting around, looking for some place where the S-channel uh, is going to go on shell. Right? But I can also think of it as a bridge like that. That's a bridge on the factorization channel in the T-channel. So depending on how you interpret this as adding a bridge to something which is singular, you're exposing one or the other factorization channel in one object. Of course, string theorists are used to seeing this kind of thing all the time from the world sheet. But uh, this is another instance of the same phenomenon, except uh, on a, on a, it goes well, well beyond four points and is, uh, is, is a lot more powerful in constraining the structure of the amplitude. OK. And of course, there's no obvious strings here. Although, of course, there are unobvious strings because, well, because <laughs> this whole thing is dual to a string theory. OK. Uh, yes, exactly. And this is BCFW. This is the BCFW computation. And putting, in fact, I'm just going to give you what the BCFW uh, uh, calculation looks like in terms of on-shell diagrams. Okay? But I want to mention one more thing before we uh, proceed, 
which is so this looks like this looks like the nicest representation you could possibly have for the amplitude, but there's something missing, which is you know the four particle amplitude is completely cyclically invariant, but this picture doesn't look cyclically invariant. If I cycle everything over by one, the, the colors change. So there, there must be an interesting little identity that says that anywhere in an on-shell diagram, this can be replaced with that. Okay. That's just an identity, and it's not just with their external legs, right? because everything is on shell. If this occurs anywhere deep inside a graph, it doesn't matter at all. Okay. Amazingly, that identity, it's called the square move, is going to be the engine of almost all of the non-trivial things in this, in this problem. That little atomic thing is going to be the engine of almost all the non-trivial mathematical structures involved here. And while we're at it, let me tell you all of the interesting moves. Okay. So um, had we been a little more systematic, after looking at, even before looking at this one, we would have looked at an even dumber one, which is just gluing two black vertices together. Okay, we can glue two black vertices together. Now what is that doing? This is forcing that these lambdas are parallel, which are in turn are parallel to them. So the only constraint that it's imposing on the, on, on the outside is that all the lambdas are parallel. Sorry, all the lambda tildes are parallel. Okay? Well, that's exactly the same constraint as I would have gotten had I drawn that. Okay? So, so the, the general rule is that if you have any string of black vertices that are connected to each other, you can actually collapse them all together and re-expand any way you like. So that's uh, merge, and the same is true for white vertices, of course. Merge, unmerge. In fact, what that really means is that if you have a general graph, trivalent graph, just with three-point uh, 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 vertices, with black and white vertices, you can collect all the black vertices together and white vertices together in this way, so that it's no longer trivalent, but it's what's called bi bipartite. So that uh, so it's, it's got black and white vertices, and the only edges connect black to white. Okay, we could do that, um, uh, but I, I prefer to draw them uh, trivalent because it re always reminds you of their underlying uh, origin coming from gluing together uh, three-point vertices. Okay. Okay, so these are two equivalences between many different uh, between different on-shell graphs. There's one other equivalence that's going to turn out to be uh, important, although it has a somewhat different interpretation, so I'll put it on the side here, which is if you ever see an on-shell graph with this bubble. Now this is clearly doing absolutely nothing from the point of view of the outside. Okay? Just says the lambdas are parallel to the lambdas. That's it. Lambda tildes are parallel to the lambda tildes. And so as far as the outside is concerned, I should just be able to replace that with that, obviously. Okay? I should just be able to remove that, that bubble. However, if you just count, there's actually an extra integration variable here. Just count how many integration variables there are. There's one extra integration variable. That integration variable seems completely irrelevant. There's an irrelevant variable here. And so, so there could be some integration, but nothing depends on it. So we can just put it out to the side. Nothing at all uh, depends on it. So there's an irrelevant variable, and if we get rid of this irrelevant variable, this thing of, of reducing a bubble is called uh, reduction. Okay? The relevant variable associated with the loop. OK. So th those are three interesting operations on these, uh, those three interesting operations on the on-shell diagrams. We'll see, we'll, see, uh, we'll see in a bit that um, see, uh, those operations don't change the number of faces of the graph. Okay? Whereas this reduces the number of faces of the graph by uh, removing bubbles. And in a sense that we'll make precise later, all of the information about the loop, uh, almost all the information about the loop integrand uh, um, is, is actually contained in these so-called irrelevant variables. Okay? But they're isolated in such a nice controlled way that we're going to produce the integrand in a form which is, uh, uh, which is very different than the normal form that we're used to seeing it and which strongly suggests, uh, well, many things, but um, 
very nice ways of actually carrying out the uh, integrations. Okay, so but yeah. Yes, the Erlang variables are the loop integrand, in fact. Okay, so so really, but but I'll, I'll have to. It'll make more sense when I when I tell you exactly how to think about what the uh, loops are. Um, can I have like fifteen minutes? Okay, because we have this hard deadline, right? Okay. Okay, because I, I do want to do. Uh, I really mean fifteen minutes, so. Because I, I do want to at least finish how these on-shell diagrams are actually related to the physical amplitude. Okay. Okay. So first of all, let me tell you what do the BCFW recursion relations at tree level look like in terms of on-shell diagrams. Okay. And again, the basic point is that all the singularities, the actual singularities of the amplitude, of tree amplitudes are these factorization channels. So as on-shell diagrams, they look like that, where this is some on-shell diagram on the left and some on-shell diagram on the right. The idea of the BCFW recursion relation is to take an amplitude, spans on some n and 1 and so on, to look at it deformed in z. So instead of trying to keep track of the general problem of many complex variables, just pick one direction to go off in the complex plane in z. And to argue that in the z plane, uh, you have poles. The poles correspond to uh, all the factorization channels where particle n is on one side and particle 1 is on the other side. Okay? The reason is that all the channels where n and 1 are on the same side, you don't notice them because the momenta for pn and p1 Pn plus P1 uh, aren't shifted. So by doing this shift, you're allowing yourself to find poles that for generic momenta are not there. The poles that you can find are the ones where n is on one side and one is on the other. Okay? So we know I mean, the residue on all these poles. And then use Cauchy's theorem to determine the amplitude in terms of knowing what all its residues are. The non-trivial part that's not true for a random theory is that there also has to be no pole at infinity. From the point of view of Feynman diagrams and field theory, that's a non-trivial statement that there's no poles at infinity, but it turns out to be true. So let's just, uh, uh, and even if no one ever told us about Lagrangians or Feynman diagrams and so on, intrinsically from this point of view, we can understand why it is that this, that this answer actually is, is uh, correct. Okay? But let me not uh, uh, go, go over that in too much detail. But, but that fact that there's no pole at infinity is really the, the, and the, the, the uh, a part of a, a, a lot of the miracles here, because what we're doing is using a very small subset of all the factorization channels that the, that the theory has to determine the whole amplitude. Okay? So um, that means that in shifting in this way, guaranteeing that you just match these factorization channels, is uh, making all the other factorization channels work as well. So everything works by just exposing a small subset of them. All right, but let's just try to say that in our on-shell diagram language. So it's just saying that the it's just saying that the tree amplitude that that the uh, the uh, tree amplitude. So first of all, let me say it a little more abstractly. We want to say that the singularities of the tree amplitude. I'm writing it suggestively to look like boundary. That might become, uh, that'll become clearer later. But really, for the moment, I mean singularities of the tree amplitude are these things. And so you sort of, you think of this as, as a differential equation. You want to give a solution to this differential equation. A solution to the differential equation is that the amplitude itself, this is the BCFW solution, is the sum over splitting n in 1. So you make n in 1 special, splitting n in 1 on the left and the right, and adding a bridge. Okay. So <clears throat> let me just, uh, let's just use this to build some pieces. Let me just use this as to do another example. So in going from 3 to 4, 
that's just what, what, what we did. So that's 3, 3, and we, 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 we put a bridge there. Okay. Now let's say I want to go from 4 to 5. Okay, there are different terms in 4 to 5, but one of them is 4 on one side and 3 on the other side. Okay, so that's 4 on one side, so here's 4 on one side. Here's 3 on another side, and I have to put a bridge. Oh, sorry. And actually, only this is the coloring, which actually gives you a non-zero answer. The other one is a, the other one is a zero. Okay. So, okay. So this thing with two loops in it is actually the five-particle tree amplitude. That's the four-particle tree amplitude. Okay. Let's do a piece of the six-particle amplitude. Oh, so sorry. But if I look at this guy. So I say, let me redraw it so it's prettier. This also doesn't look cyclic. It looks now even worse than the square, right? But just a fun exercise to do is to use the square identity on this one, reverse the colors, use the merge anti-merge operation, and tuck, you'll get the guy that's rotated over by one. So we are getting this idea that they're objects, they're the diagrams. They're not already even at the very beginning, they're not unique representatives of something. Okay? There's lots of different ways of, uh, they have lots of different forms that they can take to represent the same thing, related by these basic moves. Okay? BCFW is never going to let us see things in a manifestly cyclic way, but we can, we can uh, try to relate things uh, uh, to each other with the identities that, that, that we have. All right, and now let's look at a piece of this. Yeah, yes. Eventually, you need more than one diagram. Yes, eventually we'll need more than one diagram. In fact, if you keep going like this for MHV amplitudes, for just k equals two, only one term survives all the time, which is how, from this point of view, you get the Park Taylor, and that and that really corresponds to continuing to so. So, for example, at at six points, I just. Do this again. Seven points, I just do it again. And so on. Okay, so I just keep adding, uh, I just keep adding one of these guys. So, so and, and just for these guys, it suffices to use the, uh, the uh, square moves to show that they're all the same. Starting at k equals 3, which are the next MHV amplitudes, you have sums of terms. And then the fact that the, amp the amplitudes are all equal to each other is a more non-trivial identity that involves sums of things equals sums of things. Okay? And really, it was a pursuit of trying to understand more abstractly where those identities come from uh, three years ago that, that, put, that, 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 that led uh, uh, to, to seeing this underlying Grassmannian structure. Okay. So, um, so those identities are very non-trivial. I mean, if someone hands you the rational functions, they check these identities. They're very difficult to, uh, to uh, check. But, uh, but now, I mean, we understand their, their, uh, their origin. In fact, let me just write one of the terms of the six-particle amplitude, just, just, just for fun. I'll use it in a second. So one of the pieces in, at six particles uh, would be uh, to, to have four on one side and four on the other side and put a bridge on it. OK, so let's draw four on one side, four on the other side, and put a bridge on it. So that's, 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 that's uh, an on-shell diagram representative for a six-part five. Now, already here, I mean, it's there, it's there ma manifestly in the BCFW way of thinking about things. But when you draw them as on-shell diagrams, you feel their force even more. We are now talking about tree amplitudes without ever using virtual particles. There's no virtual particles anywhere. Okay? Everything is being represented as, as, as an on-shell process. But of course, the intermediate momenta are going to be complex. I mean, so, but there's nothing off shell here anywhere. Okay. All right. <clears throat> now, I just want to tell you from this point of view what the modification is, what we have to add to now not just be doing BCFW at tree level, but the full theory at all loops. 
And that really goes back to this picture and says that there's one more kind of singularity that the amplitude can have at loop level. Okay, one of them is this factorization channel. But another one, when we have loops, so if this is at L loops, so this would be at you know, L1 loops and L2 loops with L1 plus L2 equals L. But something else that we can have is something at L minus 1 loops with two adjacent legs merged with each other. Now, why do I say that? If you imagine having at one loop, you have some integrand, we're integrating over a bunch of, uh, we're integrating over off-shell momenta, but what do we know about it? We know that it, it, it should have a single cut. A single cut will mean there's that, uh, that, that at a place where it goes on shell, what it, it must be interpreted as a lower tree amplitude, but now with what was the loop amplitude cut open with the particle momentum here, momentum there, so those momentum have got to be equal and opposite to each other. That's what that joining is guaranteeing. Okay? And I'm integrating over the phase space of those guys. Right? So this is called the forward limit. And it's just the, when I say singularity here, I mean what happens when you put one constraint on the, on, on the form that you're integrating to give you the amplitude. And at tree level, it's just uh, the factorization. And at loop level, it's just that. Now, of course, this is a very, very famous structure that we've seen over and over again everywhere in physics. It's a structure of the exact Wilsonian uh, uh, wilson polchinski renormalization group equation that we were talking about a little earlier today. It's the BV equation. It's the, what the boundaries look like in string field theory. There, there's a, this is a very universal kind of structure. Why is it occurring here? It's actually occurring for a very similar reason as it occurs in the Wilsonian RG. It's always because you're trying to isolate something. In the Wilsonian RG, you're, you, you're, you're integrating a little shell, and you want to isolate the things that are inside that shell. So only two things can happen, those two. Here, we're trying to put one constraint on, uh, on, on the form that, that, that we're integrating. The only, there are only two things that can happen, which look exactly the same. The interpretations are radically different. But the, but, the, but, but the picture is, uh, is, is, is exactly the same. And so you won't be surprised that the solution is, the solution here was to put a bridge for n and 1. So here's to put a bridge on n and 1. Okay. And this is the all loop. DCFW recursion relation for n equals 4 super Young Mills. We don't have to draw diagrams, and we can draw diagrams. You can also just do it all mechanically on the uh, computer, or you can do the algebra by hand if you want. Okay. But now, what, what do I mean by this? What can I possibly mean, mean, mean by this? I mean, at least at tree level, at least at tree level, even though there's no virtual internal particles, finally I have some answer on the outside that's just a function of the external momenta. So that, that looks fine. But what could I possibly mean by that? When I say that it's the loop, it's, uh, that that's giving me the loops, there's got to be some four-dimensional loop integral at one loop. Where's the D4L? The most basically, you know, what's D4L? There too. I mean, that's why we think they're virtual particles. You know, at one loop, we have these things. They're off-shell on the inside, D4L. How can I, heck, can I possibly be uh, getting that from something that's purely on-shell? Yeah? What point did we start with the macadam or input? Well, in all of these pictures, in, uh, 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 first of all, the fact that none of these pictures have any pluses and minuses on them <laughs> means that I've been doing it all with n equals 4. Okay? But, 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 but as far as, as, far as the, uh, the uh, physics is concerned, it's really the fact that things vanish at infinity and you don't have to worry about what's going on at infinity. That's really what n equals 4 is, uh, is uh, buying. Okay? In fact, uh, if I have time, I will tell you how all these things are modified. I mean, there's, how all these things are modified when n is less than 4. Okay? Um, but, uh, but, but for the moment, let's stick even with planar, and with, uh, with, uh, planar n equals 4. You see, I'm using the planarity here 
in imagining that everything is ordered, so there's always n and 1, and there's a notion of the two guys here that were between n and 1. Okay, so now, now that's planar, and so this uh, makes, makes sense. Yes, yes, yes. So let me, let me explain that very explicitly now. So for example, let's say I want to get the four particle one loop amplitude. What this tells me to do is to take the six particle amplitude. So what does this picture, what does this picture mean? Okay? It means let's first call this guy A and B to begin with. Okay? So there's like four A, B, one, two, three. Okay? So I'm starting with a six particle amplitude, tree amplitude. Okay? The six particle M tree here. And first, I have to make the momentum of A and B equal and opposite and sum over all the helicities. Okay? So that means that, that I take M tree, which is a function of 4, 1, 2, 3, and AB. Sorry, maybe I should say 4, A, B, 1, 2, 3. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate over D4 eta tilde of this guy, so this is m tree 6 of 4. So I'm going to set the eta tilde for a and b equal to each other. So that's eta tilde. Let me call them a, for example. I'll call them both a. And furthermore, I'm going to make the lambda and lambda tildes equal as well. Or the lambdas for b is going to be the opposite, let's say. 1, 2, 3. Okay, is that clear? So I literally take the tree amplitude and I take, it's called the forward limit because I'm taking two of the particles and making the momenta equal and opposite. Okay? And I'm summing over all the helicities. Now, so that's what that means as an on-shell diagram. And now I'm also integrating over the phase space of that guy that I merged. So I'm doing the integral d squared lambda a, d squared lambda tilde a over GL1. Now this thing is manifestly an, an, an on-shell object, completely manifestly an on-shell object. It's a three-dimensional integral, right? That's, a loop integral is a four-dimensional integral, not a three-dimensional integral. Let's forget about virtual and virtual. Let's just dumbly count how many integration variables there are. This is a three-dimensional integral, but I'm not done yet. I have to put a bridge on here. That's what I'm instructed to do. So really what I do is I put a four hat of z, one hat of z, and I further do an integral dz over z. Okay? Now I have a four form. I have a four form, which is dz over z, this guy. Right? So at least the number of integrations matches. Now I want to claim that that thing as a four form is exactly the four form of the four particle amplitude, one loop amplitude. However, in order to prove that to you, well, uh, at least it would be nice for me to um, give you the explicit mapping between what people normally call L and these objects, where there's nothing virtual. Everything is uh, on shell. Okay? So what is that explicit mapping? It's very simple. What people normally call L is, for me, lambda lambda tilde plus z lambda 1 lambda n tilde. Okay? It's exactly what it looks like. You know, it, it's, the, it's the cut momentum. But now there's some extra, because of the deformation, there's some extra momentum going through it. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Lambda A, lambda tilde A. Okay? And this generalizes to all, to all loop order. Okay? It defines an L. But this is just in order to talk to people who like Ls. You know? Actually, it's not just for that. Because as a four form, this is a beautiful four form. All of its singularities are guaranteed to be correct. It's the correct four form. Um, Presented in some interesting variables, which are not the usual way that we present them. It's completely on shell form. Okay? <clears throat> um, but one reason to do this uh, identification is because if we actually want to integrate it, we ultimately want to know what is the contour that we're integrating on. What is the real slice? Okay? And the reality condition is simply set in terms of these L's. Okay? But regardless, this is a completely concrete map between on shell diagrams and the usual way of presenting loop integration variables. And you see D4L is nothing other than D squared lambda, D squared lambda tilde over GL1, DZ times N lambda N1 lambda tilde. A, A. 
mean, that's just that's just the uh, that's just the that's so whatever this thing is, I can also just read off what it is as a D4L. Okay, so that's in principle completely specified, and that's actually now. The way we talked about these things two years ago was in momentum twister space for various reasons and to make things a little more, it's a computationally a little, a little bit easier, but this is actually conceptually what is actually going on and it's completely concrete. I mean, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it and it's what we actually do to get these answers at three, four loops, you know. So this is it, okay? There's no ambiguity, you press return, Mathematica does all the algebra and it spits out the loop integrate. But there's this important conceptual point behind it. Everything is real. Everything is, sorry, not real, it's complex, but everything is on shell. Okay? We're talking about loop amplitudes with everything on shell. But there's actually more. Yeah. Sorry? No, 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 no you see, the, there's this nice form that sits there, the integrand. Okay? There's a four form, an eight form, and so on. Those are beautiful objects. You can choose the contour on which you want to integrate them. If you integrate them on the usual Minkowski space contour, you'll get infrared divergences, you have to worry about it. If we weren't doing this for n equals four, if we're doing it for n equals zero, which you could do, um, you would get ultraviolet divergence, you'd have to worry about it. But there's a piece of the calculation, which is normally sum up zillions of Feynman diagrams, which is just replaced here completely, and something that just gives you these, these, these objects. I should have stressed this, that these on-shell diagrams um, don't always give you a number. Sometimes if you have an equal number of integration variables and internal lines, everything, the internal lambdas are all nailed and you just get a number out. Those cases in the literature were called leading singularities in this language in, 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 in the past. But you could have more, you could have less, it doesn't matter. In general, they give you a form. There's some form. If you have, for example, in the case, in the first factorization channel case, there were too many, so it imposed constraints on the external data force them to be on a factorization channel. In these cases, there are too few to fix all the internal lambdas, and then there are still some things you've got to integrate. There's still a form, and those forms give you the loop integrand. Okay? Yes? Sorry? Uh, there's no collinear divergence at all. It's beautifully finite. No collinear divergences of any sort. This is, this is another wonderful feature of n equals four super Yang mills, which is that these forward limits are not well-defined in general, but they're well-defined in uh, n equals four super Yang mills. Okay. So, uh, so that's, uh, um, and not just n equals four super Yang mills. They're, 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 they're probably well-defined in any supersymmetric theory. So that's gonna be one of the differences between n equals zero and, uh, and uh, n equals one already. But um, yeah, but uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's right. That's right. Well, so, uh, the, so indeed. So you, you could draw pictures like this, whatever you want, and the question is what it has to do with the amplitude. Okay? I'm saying that if you draw these pictures for n equals 4, it gives you the amplitude. Then we can ask, it's a very interesting question to ask what it gives you in the other cases. Okay? I mean, I'd be very happy to talk a lot about n less than 4, because there's a very beautiful structure there. But, uh, but, um, but we're going to have our hands full with the n equals 4 uh, for, for, for a little while. Yeah. I mean, is there a topological counting of the number of integrals you have to do? Yes, 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 yes. It's very simple. It's a, the, 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 the number of integration variables is the number of faces minus one. Number of faces minus one. Yes. It's a number, actually, it's a number, uh, the number of loop, the, the, the number of free, really free integration variables turns out to be the number of faces of the graph minus one minus two n minus four. This will become a little more, more, more clear later, but n is the ex number of the external legs. So for example, in this little square, the number of faces is five. I include the boundary faces, okay? So I could have taken one of those ends out of there, but anyway, this is the way I remember it. So it's five minus one is four, and two n minus four is four, so there's none. So that's why it just gives you something flat out, okay? So, <clears throat> but uh, before I end, I actually want to show you what this looks like, okay? In terms of an on-shell diagram. This is also going to make another point. Now, all of this discussion is just to try to convince you that these on-shell diagrams are interesting and important objects to understand. Okay? So we see here they're not just curiosities, they determine the amplitude. And now I'm going to show you they not only determine the amplitude, but they, they determine it in a very different looking form than we're used to. 
and a form that makes it much easier to imagine integrating them to get a final answer. And, well, I'll have more speculations about what that might mean, but it's possible connections to the underlying dual world sheet description next time. But well, let's just see a concrete example. So let's look at the four particle one loop amplitude. Okay. Well, so I should take the forward limit of the six particle amplitude. And there are three terms in the six particle amplitude. Let me not bore you with two of them being zero trivially. So let's just focus on the one of them that, that turns out to give us an answer that's not zero trivially. And that's exactly the one that I drew for you before. Okay. So this is a piece of the six particle tree amplitude. So I'm first constructing it from BCFW. Okay. Now I'm instructed to take the forward limit and add a bridge. Okay. So this hideous looking beast that looks a little bit like a space alien is supposed to be the four particle one loop amplitude. Let's just count how many faces does it have. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine faces. Okay? So nine minus one is eight. Minus two and minus four is four. So there are four extra faces, and those are the four integration variables. All right? Now, this form doesn't look all that well. Actually, this form is telling us a story. This form is exactly telling us the story of where it came from. I know oh, it's a bridge on top of a forward limit of the six particle amplitude. Beautiful. Okay. But a few square moves later, if you use the square moves and merge on merge operations and so on, you find the same object can be represented in a completely different looking form. So let me draw what it looks like. That's the four particle one loop amplitude. Okay. So we call these uh, Star Wars diagrams. You can see we have aliens on the brain. So we have aliens, <laughs> Star Wars diagram because it looks like the Death Star going into the. Sorry. That, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yeah, Donald got it. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I didn't do a good enough job. You see, it gets more impressive when there's more of them. So it's uh, okay. But, but look, this is a totally different, oh, so, and by the way, what do I mean by these vertices with four guys? Remember, I can merge and unmerge these guys any way I like, okay? So this has a completely different picture for what it is. It's saying I'm taking a tree amplitude, and I'm just deforming the external legs into the complex plane, okay? Four times. In fact, let me draw it, let me actually unmerge it a little bit, just to make that very explicit. This is showing that the, this is showing us that the loop amplitude is actually four BCFW shifts, one after the other, okay? I start with the tree amplitude, then I shift that guy, then that guy, then that guy, then that guy, and I get the loop amplitude. Now remember, the measure for each one of these BCFW shifts was just dz over z. So this is telling you something amazing, that the four-particle tree amplitude, the four-particle one-loop amplitude, is equal to the four-particle tree amplitude times, in these variables, just dz1 over z1, dz2 over z2, dz3 over z3, dz4 over z4, 30 years, right? This is the, the most basic one loop integral that, 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 that you stare at. But in this form, I mean, even without telling you the explicit change of variables, which I'll tell you in a moment, we'll just write it down in a second, there's something, there's something remarkable about this. It's telling you there exists some set of variables where this is equal to a bunch of d logs, okay? Doesn't look like a bunch of d logs. So, how is it a bunch of uh, d logs? Well, of course, we don't have to guess because we know the rules, right? We know the rules. We know exactly what the map is between L and our variables. Okay? So I can tell you what it is. And it turns out to be, so instead of writing them all out, let me just write as d log of L squared, d log L plus P1 squared, d log L plus P1 plus P2 squared, d log L minus P4 squared. Well, this part looks almost stupid because you're just putting a d log of everything that's there in the denominator. 
So you might have thought, well, it was obviously d logs then. But of course, this is, doesn't make any sense because that has units. What goes in there to cancel the, uh, the uh, units? And if you just looked at this naively, you'd say nothing. We just have four momenta. What else can we do? There, there's nothing there. But as people have known for a long time, staring at these uh, loop integrals, uh, especially thinking about their leading singularities, there are other special light-like momenta in the problem. There are the light-like momenta that cut all four of these propagators. And so that's what actually goes in here. It's L minus lambda 1, lambda tilde 3. That's one choice, for example. And that's just there for all of them. Using the L's here and so on is, is particularly clumsy if you want to do calculations. There are better ways of doing it, but I wanted to uh, just show it in completely standard, uh, in completely standard variables. Okay? So this thing was secretly all along for D logs. <laughs> But in this way, first of all, we didn't know it before, but even if you did, you'd have to be clever and think and make changes of variables. Okay? But when you think on shell, it's handed to you in that form. It hands it to you in the form where it's a bunch of d logs. Yes, yes, very much so. Very, very much so. You know, so, so, uh, so all of these things depend on the external momenta. These appear not to depend on the external momenta, but remember the, remember the map between the L and the lambda, lambda, tilde, and the Z was that L was lambda, lambda, tilde, plus Z, lambda, and lambda, one, tilde. That's where the external data entered there, right? Yeah, but, but after we right. take it, yeah. after we take it, we have a dependence on external momenta? Yes, certainly. But all of that comes in because of the, because of, because of the fact in, in fact, very good. So, you see, when you write it in this form, or even in this form, so, let's say you look at it in this form, and someone tells you to do the integral. Of course, by now, any professional amplitude person will call this the most trivial integral and so on, but to me, it's not a trivial integral, okay? So, you have to Feynman parameterize, do this, do that, and so on. Okay, and you get some, uh, you get some answer, but, at least your first reaction when you look at it is not that this is a trivial integral. Your first reaction is this is a hard integral. Maybe you have to do some tricks or something or another, right? You look at this integral and your first reaction is this is a trivial integral. Not only is it trivial, it's zero. Because you're integrating d, 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 d. So you just take one d out and use Stokes' theorem and you're done. It's zero. Okay? So you have dramatically different psychological attitudes towards what the answer is going to look like. Very hard or zero. The answer is exactly in between. Okay? And the reason it's in between is that the reason this doesn't integrate to zero is that these logs, especially with these complex points, have branch cuts. Okay? And you have to study where those branch cuts are. But the general story, which, which we understand for a large class of integrals now, but not, not for all of them, the story which is evolving, is that in this presentation, you see, what this presentation is really about is it presents the integrand in a way where all of its singularities are completely manifest. You don't have to go looking for them. They're handed to you where you see all of them. And then when you examine uh, uh, where these branch cuts are in space-time and do Stokes' theorem, uh, and, and do Stokes' theorem like you should, paying attention to where they are, you find that these, at one loop, four-dimensional integrals reduce to two-dimensional integrals that live on a sphere. Okay? At two loops, at, at, at many loops, for a large class of integrals that we know how to deal with this way, there's a big reduction from 4L integrations to 2L integrations. And it's not just a random reduction, it's a 2L reduction that lives on a two-dimensional surface in the, in the space time. Okay? So for example, if all the points were Euclidean, that's not the case here, but just to make it simple, if, the, if, if you're doing like the box integral, okay, just the most basic thing, four Euclidean points, d4x over x minus x1 th squared through x minus x4 squared, that integral, when presented in this d log form, localizes to a two-dimensional sphere in Euclidean space. That's a two-dimensional sphere on which these four points lie. So if, if you hand me four points in Euclidean space, they lie on a two-sphere. So there's a natural two-sphere in the problem. And these big four-dimensional integrals actually localize to the surface of that sphere. And it's that localization that actually makes them easy to do and to, uh, and to understand why are they polylogarithms, for example. You know, that we, we saw these beautiful formulas in uh, Johannes' talk with like bazillions of harmonic polylogs and so on. But you could even ask a more, very more basic question. Someone wakes you up in the middle of the night and says, why are amplitudes polylogarithms at all? Why do, these functions, uh, why do these functions occur at all? It's not 100% obvious, 
Um, but, uh, and especially, you have so many more loop integration variables in the ultimate transcendental, uh, transcendentality of the answer. But the fact that they, in the D log form, localize from big integrals to smaller ones is, I think, uh, likely to be important to understand the general structure. The reason I mumbled this speculation about being related to a putative world sheet calculation is that it's really going down to a sphere or two-dimensional surfaces that live in the space-time. And it's measures on these two-dimensional surfaces that looks like logs and derivatives of logs. So it really does not look far from what you would get from some actual correlation function of a two-dimensional theory that lives on those spheres. So from this point of view, the purpose in life of all of these extra integration variables, which are being removed once we actually do the integral on a real slice, is to make it totally obvious all these other properties. Uh, why it's unitary, I mean, all these other things are being made completely manifest from this picture. Start from an on diagram. Yes. Uh, yes. Is there a systematic way by which you can know what the integration range is or what Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I, I just told you. I mean, in fact, uh, um, when I. So when, 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 no, no, no. Uh, uh, this is what you get if you actually take the rules that I told you. I just skipped ahead to the end to, uh, to, to show you. We could have gone, gone through it. I gave you the completely concrete rule, right? I said, when you do this, ultimately it was that d squared lambda, d squared lambda tilde, dz over z, right? I'm going to tell you, how do you interpret that four-dimensional integral as d4l, OK? And, and the rule was that l is lambda, lambda tilde, plus z, lambda, and tilde, lambda 1, or the other way around. That's it. That's, that's, that's a change of variables. Now, now, how that looks like this, I, you'll have to see a little more uh, tomorrow. Because we started off with the space alien diagram. Okay? And then you do these square moves and so on. The variables change in some way under square moves. I haven't told you what they are, but there are some rules, some simple rules, tuck, 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 tuck. You bring it to this point. You just read off the z's, and you find they're exactly that. Okay? There's no ambiguity whatsoever. But I actually want to stress that, uh, that there is this, but, but the whole notion of an on-shell diagram tells you that the form itself has some intrinsic worth. <laughs> okay? that there, there, there are these beautiful zero forms, four forms, eight forms, which are the integram. There's all sorts of things in between, which are all, all sorts of other things in between. Cuts, unitarity cuts, single cuts, you know, more complicated things in between. There's this whole zoo of on-shell forms, and there's natural ranges, there's natural places you can integrate them, which actually produce the final amplitudes. Okay? All right, so that was really the introduction to this part and relating, really going from scattering amplitudes to thinking about on shell diagrams. So, what we're going to do tomorrow is actually try to compute these on shell diagrams. Okay? And um, so, uh, and there's a little part of it, but there's one part that looks hard. The part that looks hard is momentum conservation. Okay. So it's unusual for momentum conservation to be the hard part, but again, it's not, it's not unexpected, because always when you turn things around, the things that were trivial from the usual point of view become hard from the new point of view, and vice versa. So in this case, it's really momentum conservation that is the tough part. And why is it tough? It's because all the internal lines are enforcing this quadratic constraint on the external data. Okay. But on the other hand, if you think about it for a second, it can't be that hard, because the individual three-particle vertices have this incredibly simple geometry for momentum conservation. Right? So we should be able to exploit that fact. And in fact, but that tells us that as beautiful as this three-particle amplitude is that we wrote, we said it's nailed by Poincaré invariance, everything is beautiful and great about it, there's still something to be desired from it. There's still one more piece of information it has to give us, which is that if I just write down the three-particle amplitude, it doesn't tell me immediately that that's the geometry of momentum conservation, with a lambda and a lambda tilde looking like that. That it has to be a one-plane orthogonal to two plane. It's something I discover by sitting on the support of the delta function. So you could ask for something that's just one step nicer still, which is some representation of just the good old-fashioned three-particle amplitude, which makes even that fact manifest. It's attempting to do that where the Grassmannian enters the story a second time. We'll introduce little Grassmannian variables associated with each one of the three-particle vertices. And that will all of a sudden allow us to trivially carry out all the integrations over the inter intermediate lines. What we'll then be left with is a bunch of integrations over these new variables that we introduced, which glue these three-particle uh, vertices into 
some point in the Grassmannian GKN. Okay? <clears throat> so from there, we're going to get a correlation between on-shell diagrams and the Grassmannian. <clears throat> and then the fact that there seem to be so many different representations of these objects and so on and so forth, um, the effort to understand that will actually expose what's the backbone of the entire story, which is not really the on-shell diagrams, um, and not even really the Grassmannian, but a new way of thinking about permutations. So the thing that sits underneath all of this is a new structure in combinatorics, and a new way of thinking about uh, permutations. And so it's that, uh, so really, so the, the separation was to today convince you that on-shell diagrams are important and, and interesting, and tomorrow tell you how to think about them in the positive Grassmannian. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank <laughs> you.